Welcome back, everyone. Welcome to the final session in the industry's first conference focused exclusively on safety topics and sterile processing. This conference has been sponsored by Sertal International, and our goal at Beyond Clean was to pull together speakers who could provide critical information on worker safety, because that is directly tied to patient safety in the end. I want to call your attention to the list of downloadable resources put together by our conference sponsor and the individual speakers that's on the right hand side of your page. You'll also find instructions for accessing your CE certificate in that list. Uh, you also receive an email in about an hour with that same access information. Our final speaker today is Steve Sutton. Um, Steve joined BellyMed in 2013 in their planning and design group as a project engineer, and he currently serves as director of planning and design. This presentation I'm so excited about because it's going to review the effect of design on the health, safety, and welfare of the staff working in um, and patients served by the central processing department. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Steve Sutton. Thanks, Lindsay, uh, and thank you everyone who's watching live uh, and joining me on your uh, on your Saturday. Uh, we're going to be reviewing uh, how we design a safe and effective central sterile services department, uh, what I like to call CSST Design 101. Uh, really developed this uh, out of you know educating different design partners and things like that around the country, and uh, started to develop some common threads and common themes across different projects on deficiencies and designs and things like that. And then we expanded it to kind of include the end users and, and kind of advocate for them and educate them on, on what things they can do on the front end in a central sterile design project um, to, to improve the outcome. And so just to, to recap real quick here on the objectives. So if you're watching this, uh, by the end of it, you're gonna be able to uh, understand each step that's involved in the central sterile services department. Um, and now I have, you know, we're going to show reverse role models and role models and some pictures um, uh, in here so you'll get a better uh, take. So even if you're working in the central sterile services every day, you might pick up some, some, uh, some interesting things from that. Uh, you're going to be able to identify key design choices that could impact staff and patient safety and that align with clinical best practices. So um, these could be, um, these are, could be big decisions that could be made early on in your, in your SPD design or CSST design. Um, that we want everyone to know. Uh, and then we'll identify common clinical standards and how they impact the, um, how the, the design of the physical space will impact um, those standards or meeting those standards in that space. And then we're gonna talk about how we design um, an effective workflow that's um, not only efficient, but safe for the staff that operate it every day and how we can um, change our and configure our layout to minimize staff strain and fatigue uh, while promoting you know, productivity and efficiency. Uh, right out of the gate, it's we're going to go through the, each major step of central sterile services and what happens when we reprocess uh, for, for the OR. But one uh, key point that we usually drive home at the, at the beginning and, and is maybe a departure from how uh, this department or this space in the hospital is thought of, is we really like to think of this as a manufacturing process in the healthcare setting. Right. So we've got we've kind of outlined these eight key steps that occur in every central sterile department. Um, we're not going to go into every nuance or, or minutia in detail there, but we, we want to really highlight here that we want to think of this as a manufacturing process so that we can identify areas where we can improve. Uh, and then also we want to keep um, we want to design to the end in mind. Right. So we want to make sure that um, this space or whatever we're doing, this the finished product for this central sterile department will meet the needs of, of the operating room in the hospital, not only day one, but also five, 10, 15 years in the future. Um, so we wanna keep that in mind. Also, we wanna know what the goal of this department is. So at a high level, it's returning all of the um, instrument sets, uh, clean, sterile, complete, and on time back to the operating room uh, every time. So that's really, that's the overall goal. And that's what we wanna kind of keep in mind is that, okay, if this is a manufacturing process, how can we do this better? Uh, and, and that way we can kind of develop some new ideas. So first we're gonna walk through each process step. We'll just kind of, I'll highlight them on a plan. On the left here, you can see you have your decontamination area in the bottom left-hand corner. We're gonna walk through this. Um, first is your transport mode into central sterile. How are you getting things into the department right, from the OR? So uh, in this case, this is a soiled elevator. So it's a dedicated uh, soiled uh, holding elevator that will transport case cards to and from the, uh, from the OR to central sterile services. Uh, the ne next, we have uh, the decontamination area. 
So this is where you're doing your gross decontamination process. Um, uh, you're washing your instrumentation, you're getting it ready for the washing disinfectors, you're moving your carts through the, the uh, cart washer, uh, as well as your containers. And then next you have your clean assembly, uh, and then that's where you're getting your instrumentation ready to be sterilized. Then next you have your storage area, where you're storing all of your case carts and all of your instrumentation once it's been sterilized uh, before it goes uh, back up to the OR to be used. And then your transport mode there. And in this case, you know, it can be a hallway um, or it could be a dedicated elevator. So first step is transport. How do we get volume from the operating room to Central Sterile? Uh, I'm actually getting this picture that you're seeing here is case cards in a hallway uh, outside the decontamination area. Uh, this is a reverse role model, right? Uh, as this is a patient corridor, we need to maintain that space. Uh, and now we have case cards, soil case cards, biohazard case cards sitting in you know, a public corridor. Uh, not an ideal outcome, not what we wanted to design for. If you were to open that door into decontamination, you would see that it would it's overflowing with case cards and they have no more room. That's why they're in the hallway. So a um, little foreshadowing here, but that's why we want to design our working process queues appropriately. But this is just a method of, of mode of transportation. How are we getting from the OR to the CSSD or the SPD? We want to think about that in the design process. Next step is in the decontamination area, you're doing your disassembly, your cleaning, um, and then uh, your manual cleaning process uh, before your washer disinfectors. Here, we're, I'm kind of showing a novel way that you can uh, align up your work in process queues for your different workstations where the staff, see the staff person is gowned up in their personal protective equipment where you can keep everyone at the workstation being productive and they don't have to go searching for the next set that they have to work on. It's all coming to them on a gravity free roller in this case. So. That was a novel solution that one of our customers came up with. Next step, washing and disinfection. Uh, typically, a, uh, a thermal, some type of thermal disinfection occurs at this stage if it's going through the wash disinfectors or they, if they can't be, uh, if they cannot go through the wash disinfectors, the instrumentation is then passed through a pass-through window or a pass-through dryer of some kind, uh, and then they move on to assembly and inspection. Now, here is where uh, the staff are sitting at their workstations. Uh, they're reviewing the sets. Uh, they're assembling them in a way that the OR would expect and making sure that they have all their instrumentation. They're making sure that all the instrumentation is working properly, and then they're inspecting it for any defects, uh, pitting, staining, anything that would be deemed maybe, um, you know, a cause for a patient risk that's going to happen here. And this is really the last, last time a human is going to see the instrument set before it reaches the patient. So we really, this is a really important manually intensive process that, that, needs, to, that needs to occur. After they're done that process, they're gonna package uh, the instrumentation up in some sort of sterile barrier. It could be a sterile wrap where they're wrapping like a present, or it could be in a container where they have a filter on top that is similar material that um, is basically heat activated uh, during the sterilization process to let steam in, and then it evacuates. And then when it cools down, the pores close on that wrap. Next step is sterilization. Um, most of the volume in a central sterile department is gonna be steam sterilized. Uh, through a, um, a steam sterilizer like the one you're seeing here in this picture, uh, or it could be uh, some type of low temperature sterilizer um, if it can't, but the majority of the volume is going through a steam sterilizer. And then all that inventory volume uh, has to be stored somewhere. Uh, you're seeing a, a role model for a, a nice, beautiful sterile storage facility here. Um, and that's where they're staged. Um, really it's staging before it you know, goes up to the OR, but it could be overnight and you might have to store all of your volume in the entire hospital here at some point during the day. So it's important that that's, that that's accounted for and sized appropriately. And then last step, it's going, it's getting everything back from sterile storage back up to the OR and then setting up for the next case. And this is really kind of, that's, that completes the cycle of, of the central sterile process. I have a poll question here uh, for, the, for the audience. Uh, are you planning to start construction on a major central sterile design project in the next 6, 12, 18, 24 months, or even no plans at all? Um, always interesting to note uh, with this timeline, um, and we'll see what the results look like, but with this timeline, um, you have different levels of ability to impact your design the closer you get to construction. As documents are finalized for the general contractor to bid on and to um, start building the building, they may have an issue where you know, if you want to make a change, that may be um, uh, that they may have to redesign a portion of the building to accommodate that change. And then you have to pay the architect engineer to do their work and then they have to rebid the project. So it can be, can be a bit invasive to the design process if, if it's 
about to be constructed or you've already started construction. Okay. So a uh, majority of those watching, no plans at this time. That's right, this is gonna be great, uh, great primer for, for your, next, uh, your next event. Um, a lot here looking at the next 18 month time frame, which is uh, a great time to really start assessing options and figuring out um, what your needs are gonna be. So that's the perfect time for your really, your design process to start to, um, to shape up, depending on the size or scope of your project. Um, and then the 12 and six month time frame, very similar, but um, also, there's still enough time, depending on the size of your project, to to affect change, um, and even maybe even take some of these um, some of these um, information that we're presenting here today. Now we're going to go over some key design choices that are are going to can be decided very early, and are kind of very broad decisions that get made uh, for the design of the of the department that get made very early that could have a significant impact in the overall outcome of the department and the staff that work in it. So we want to just review those real quick um, so that everyone uh, is aware of them. So transport modes is is the first one. How are, you, how are you getting volume to the CSSD from the OR and how are you getting it back to the OR? Um, now, if we're thinking about it in terms of, you know, industrial engineering, any kind of kind of transport time is considered waste. So we want to try to minimize that. But in some cases, that's not possible. I mean, we may not be able to fit the entire department that we need with the entire OR suite on the same floor. So they have to be on different floors uh, or down the hallway or maybe not even on the same campus. Uh, so that needs to be considered. But um, in cases where we want, we do want to try to minimize the distance from the OR when we can um, to create some efficiency there. Um, three zone systems, this is a just a general overall design philosophy where we're not only just partitioning the decontamination area from the clean assembly area, but we're also partitioning the uh, sterile storage area away from the clean assembly area via, via physical walls. Now this creates, uh, this is basically an architectural design that allows the department um, to enact process control, right? So if you're passing through your washers and clean, you know anything on that side didn't do the washers, it's been clean somehow. And then anything that goes from the clean area to the sterile area, um, that's passing through a steam sterilizer uh, or a low temperature sterilizer. And if it's on the sterile storage side, it's gone through the sterilization process without issue. So we're trying to design in process controls through the design of the department. Uh, maximizing wall space between decon, clean, and sterile. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what that means in a minute. Uh, square footage to match volume. I get asked this question all the time from architects. Uh, okay, what's your square footage per number of OR? Uh, for a CSSD. And I would love to just tell them a basic number, uh, but it's really gonna depend on what kind of specialty that space is supporting. So it's a it's it's um, it's not easy to just, it's no hard and fast rule. So you really have to look at it case by case. And we'll talk about some some strategies there to, to identify that. Uh, and then future growth. Uh, you know, sur surgical programs are, are constantly growing, um, some faster than others. But when you do have growth, you wanna be able to account for that. And you're going to need the space and equipment to to be successful. So we want to at least understand what plans are for the space uh, in the future, and we want to understand future surgical volumes. All right, uh, design uh, maximizing wall space. So um, you can see here in the middle we have our decontamination area and the washers and wall there, and you see that red line there. That's the wall between your decontamination area and your clean area. Now that length of wall that is here is the wall that you put your equipment into to pass things through from, from decon to clean. Uh, the size of that wall will dictate how much equipment you could fit in your decontamination space to go through to clean, um, and thus will determine your, your theoretical maximum throughput that you can get in this space, regardless of whatever other square footage or how many, how many staff you have. So that's a critical piece there to consider, um, is making sure you're maximizing your wall space. What this looks like is if you have um, say a, um, you have a stairwell or you have an elevator bank um, in between where you would want to put your, your decontam uh, clean wall uh, or your sterile storage, uh, clean and sterile storage wall. Uh, so you might have to move things around, shift things around to the red line there is the wall between decontamination and clean. And then the yellow lines between clean and sterile storage, that wall space that we have there, that's where we could put equipment to pass through to, to, to the next zone um, for our workflow, and that could be an issue um, if that's not enough for what the volume we need to put through the department or what the plans are for that department. So you always just want to be aware of what are some support spaces around it, how can I maximize this wall space, um, and still have a, a viable workflow. Square footage, as I said, you know, everyone just wants to know 
general schematic design when you're very early in the process. You just need to know how much space do I need if it's a renovation or a new construction. Um, and it's, it's not always easy to, to answer that question, but there are, you know, you have uh, architects that you've, that your hospitals have worked with in the past that have done other central sterols, maybe, uh, maybe of similar size, maybe of similar case mix. Um, you've got vendors that, you, that you're gonna work with that have done other projects at other hospitals and have, you know, they've seen what works and what doesn't when it comes to uh, square footage and sizes of different departments with your case mix. So um, they're, they're definitely experts in the field. Leverage them early on. They can give you other general layouts to use uh, and you can get a square footage that makes sense. Um, the earlier you are, the kind of the broader, more general, that's okay. Uh, as far as overall size, if you just need 10,000, 15,000, or even 5,000 square feet, having that delineation is important. But then, you know, as the project goes on, space gets tightened up and tightened up. And by the end of the project, everyone's fighting over closets. So it's always important to maybe over provision a little bit at the beginning. And also keeping in mind your future growth plans which you may not know at this point in, in the hospital leadership may not know, but it's always good to consider. Next uh, is future growth. So not just with space, you also need to consider the fact that your equipment has to be there to support uh, your volumes. Um, so with that, you have uh, in yellow, I've got just some outlines. So we've got three washers and two sterilizers planned in day one. Go on, right? uh, there's a extensive amount of facility infrastructure that was designed in by the engineers to support that equipment. Now that equipment um, will be there day one, but if I need to add one, I need to be able to have that facility infrastructure to support the additional steam, additional drain outputs, uh, additional cold water, or hot water demands that I might have, treated water demands also is a big one. Uh, and so that infrastructure needs to be planned in to support that. Uh, and then you know, oftentimes we'll even plumb in uh, right to the termination point where the equipment would go um, here and here in red, you can see where there's future equipment the engineers are aware that they can plan it into the facility infrastructure because that makes it much less invasive to add equipment or add capacity to your, your manufacturing environment. Another poll question here, uh, what's your top design concern in central sterile when thinking about safety for patients and staff? So space, equipment, people growth, uh, workflow layout, you know, separation from, from decon clean or um, clean and sterile engineering. Um, so air balance, engineering utility, the quality of the utilities, um, kind of what's your, your top concern from those three? Give people a couple seconds here. I waited to them. And if you, you can't see the submit button, you might have to scroll down to, to click on the submit button. If you selected one, you, might have, you still have to click submit. So that might be an issue. Ah, here we go. Space, yeah. So having enough equipment, space for people um, to work in, you can have the people, but if you don't have the equipment in the space, um, you're still not gonna get um, a proper outcome. And then layout, very, very interesting to see those two tied there. Um, they're, kind of, they're almost, uh, they're linked a little bit because your layout can, can impact your space. Um, if your layout, like a hallway, you know, snaking through a building, um, your workflow is not gonna be very efficient and you'll be able to fit less equipment. So that is, uh, that is interesting. And then, yeah, utility quality, very, very important. We're also going to talk about that, too. Uh, now we're going to talk about uh, clinical best practices. Uh, you know, in the U.S., uh, particularly, you know, accreditation surveys are, are critical to maintain, um, you know, receiving funds from Medicare, Medicaid. So um, Joint Commission, DMV, those site audits, you know, they're, they're um, always an exciting time. So, um, but the design of the physical space can impact some of these areas. Um, staff safety, particularly, uh, and if you just focus on one, I mean, uh, proper area for gowning uh, with personal protective equipment before entering the space. Patient safety, uh, transport and space, and the control of those areas. So how things flow from the OR and the SPD could, and the CSST has an issue. Uh, air ventilation, air balancing, uh, limiting cro uh, environmental cross contamination, temperature and humidity, and limiting uh, microbial growth and, and controlling the space properly. Water quality, utility quality, very huge. Uh, next to laundry, uh, the central sterile is the greatest user of utilities, and particularly water in the entire hospital. And the hospital is one of the largest users of water in, in, in you know, the towns and cities. So um, we definitely want to make sure that that's um, of highest quality. Uh, hardware and interior selection seems uh, maybe, might be obvious to some, but sometimes uh, may not be obvious to an architect or an engineer. 
Uh, they may have casework that they have to uh, plan in. They may just spec laminated porous uh, particle board. Uh, even in clean side, if you hit that with a car, you, you damage the laminate and now that porous area can't be clean. Infection control uh, might have an issue with that. So. Service area lighting and ventilation. Um, because it's not, you don't typically see this from you know where you're working in single sterile, um, unless you have detergent in there that you have to change out. You know, making sure those are properly ventilated in conditioned spaces, and also having enough lighting for people to see around. And um, sometimes an afterthought, and sometimes it does get missed. So definitely want to highlight those for staff safety. A proper area for gowning. This is um, just having a vestibule uh, where someone can gown up before actually entering the decontamination area. Um, you don't see often because it, it, it is kind of an afterthought and it is it is a nice to have but also uh, it's critical to, to staff safety so in decontamination we've got you know potentially bloodborne pathogens floating around through the process of aerosolization at the from the decontamination processing sinks uh, we want to be able to protect our staff before they have to enter that space um, having a best ability to do that is, is is the way but because you know space is always usually at a premium um, that can be difficult to fit a vestibule in for the staff to gown up properly in decontamination uh, prior to that. So it's always something to think about during the design process to make sure you've got that accounted for, even in the space program, which is early, early in the design process. Um, space control, so patient safety. Um, sterile items should be stored in a manner that reduces the potential for contamination, makes sense. Uh, and then traffic should be limited to these areas um, to only those ind individuals that can properly handle it. So, and, and that are certified to do so. So like a central sterile employee, um, not maybe maybe not a vendor uh, representative or maybe not you know the general public. So um, although newer builds, they have card readers and things like that to control the space. Um, sometimes this gets missed. If you're doing a project in your area, it's always good to look at um, if you can improve another area while you're there um, and doing work in the space, um, it's always good to look at this. Uh, transport mode. So, um, this is also this is patient safety, but this is also staff safety. Um, you know, if sterile items being transported through an elevator, uh, again, I have uh, they should be dedicated to uh, an area that is clean or sterile. You know, if you have a dedicated clean or sterile, if you're transporting anything in an elevator from your CSST to the OR, that elevator should be dedicated for central sterile items only, and it should only be limited to access to a central or sterile area. Um, you know, this is another image of a reverse role model where you have the sterile goods on your left. You have your bank of elevators on your right, and then you can see case carts actually do share a elevator with patients, staff, uh, soiled instrumentation, and, and sterile instrumentation. So those are all commingling in a single space, uh, not ideal, and it should definitely be controlled. So um, just um, this is again the reverse role model. We don't want to do this, but just to think that this can happen in, in certain areas um, if, if we're not careful. So we all want to keep that in mind. Uh, air ventilation, air balancing. Um, you know, this is uh, just an excerpt from from ASHI uh, ST79. Now, now references this as well. But this is going to give you uh, for I mean, not just for for um, for patient safety, but also staff safety for um, to limit environmental cross contamination. Having um, you can see in the middle your pressure relationship to adjacent spaces. That's that air balancing. We want to have a positive pressure relative to adjacent spaces in the clean workrooms, clean assembly, or the sterile storage area. Uh, versus, say, soil or decontamination rooms should have a negative pressure relationships as well as the sterilizer or washer service areas. So that negative air pressure means any time you have a opening that's open, so a jar, so like a uh, uh, pass the window or a door in between your decontamination area and your clean area, the airflow will be go into decontamination, and you won't have any of those potentially, you know, harmful bloodborne pathogens or, or viruses that are floating around the decontamination potentially coming into a clean area where staff typically do not wear as much PPE, right? So utility quality, a uh, very, very important, uh, can have a big impact on your overall outcome as far as instrument quality. Uh, so this is something that, you know, uh, we really want to watch closely. Amy, again, has a, a TR-34 as another specification. This is just an excerpt. Equipment manufacturers for um, instrumentations may have an IFU that might state uh, water quality, and also, you know, the actual washer or sterilizer equipment manufacturers will also specify their own utility quality that they'd like to see used in their equipment. Um, and a lot of people look at hardness or, or total dissolved solids or conductivity um, to keep that low. But this we really want to see as even the um, general use water or, or potable water 
um, that comes out of the tap that you may use at the crossing sinks for general um, soaking or flushing or, or washing. That has to be of a certain quality um, uh, for a number of reasons. And also the chlorides, uh, you can see here that we may not talk about too much. Most municipalities actually put chlorine in the water um, to, to inhibit microbial growth and things like that. But um, chlorides will actively uh, react with stainless steel, which all of your central sterile equipment is made of, as well as your instrumentation that you're processing with. And so we don't want that to corrode. So we also need to make sure that that's being it. So this can be also be talked about at the beginning. And the engineers, the sooner they know this, they can plan that into their space um, um, to give you the results that, that, that you're expecting. So we're just gonna go through um, some factors that, that'll affect your workflow, efficiency, process control. So uh, a lot of this ha ha goes back to staff safety. So um, department entrances and exit locations relative to the workflow. Uh, the locations of your workstations relative to your next step uh, is gonna be key. We'll show some examples. Um, the size of your dedicated working process queue. That's a fancy way of saying, how much stuff do I have to store at before each step? Like you remember our decontamination area, how many case carts did we need to store in decon? You know, that other department got it wrong. Um, we wanna make sure that we're sizing them appropriately. So that those work in process queues can be, can be key in, in having an effective and safe department. Line of sight of employees to workstations, uh, instead of you know, having to go get up and, and check equipment all the time, we wanna keep the workers at their workstations being productive. Um, vendor loaner instrument storage, um, kind of might be slight for some people, but can be a big issue, a hot button issue for some as far as uh, vendors uh, being in the department and where do you store uh, consigned instrument sets um, that the hospital does not own. Uh, detergent clouds, it's also the same for water treatment clouds, we'll talk about those, and then space for, for scan stations and, and printers. So department access can have, and how your volume comes into the department can have a huge impact on what your overall workflow is and kind of how the staff work in the space. So you can see here, I've got an elevator that's uh, soiled elevators on our left, clean elevators on our right, and the soiled elevator is kind of pointing towards, opens towards the, the clean area, uh, and the clean elevator uh, points north, and that's how the volume comes down uh, there through the areas. But the staff that's working in the decontamination area here, we need enough space to get the work done. So we still need our sinks, we still need our washers, so we have to kind of turn, because we can't go around and go right to the clean elevator. We won't have enough space, and then they'll all give this wasted space down the bottom left. So we have to kind of um, think about how the product's gonna flow in. And if we change this just a little bit, this is the same space essentially, we just moved the elevators and changed how they open. Um, and then we were able to get a much more linear workflow um, and we could, and much better sight lines, frankly, to the elevators uh, just by changing their position within the department. Uh, another point here for workflow and, and accessing. So um, we want the flow of material to be smooth and continuous with as little backtracking and cross traffic as possible. So we don't want people having to go back for something, or we don't want to have to cross traffic with say our case carts to get our trays out of the washer. Um, so you can see here just kind of some general arrows to show how the, how the instrumentation is flowing through the department. Um, and, that, and that's because our exit's on the other side of this workflow on the right there. You can see volume coming in on our left and then flowing through the department. Uh, case cart washers are at the top and then washers in the middle and that gets flown through carbon pack and then steam sterilizer. So um, that's how we want our workflow to be. So that's important to think about that even when you're just laying it out in even schematic design or even when you're replacing equipment or placing new equipment in the space. Um, so process locations relative to the next step. So this is another area that may seem minor, uh, but where you place, say, your workstations relative to the next step uh, that staff have to traverse consistently or constantly to, um, to get the volume through the department, uh, that should be located to its next step. Now, obviously, we still have to take into account our work in process queues, but you see here on the left, uh, those things are a bit further away from the loading point of the washer automation. And so remember that transport time, there's no value being added. It's waste that we have to pay somebody to walk between those two areas. Um, and you, if you do you know, 60 runs a day, then that's 120 times they have to walk back and forth across different people. Um, that, that adds to fatigue, uh, right? So we wanna try to limit that if we can, and also making sure that we have enough space to do our work. So we move the sinks closer to the washer automation so that they don't have far. This is just one example of 
of how the workstations can be placed. And same same applies also to the prep and pack area. This is um, an example of uh, work and process queues that go that go well and work well. Um, on the left here, you can see it's another novel approach from one of our customers. They use a gravity free roller in between their prep and pack tables. And when the staff have done packaging an instrument set and it's ready to be loaded on a sterilizer cart, they can just put it on the gravity roller from their workstation and it rolls down to where the someone loads the sterilizer racks. So um, it creates an efficient uh, workflow. They have a work and process queue that automatically queues up for them. And on the right, you can see when we have too much volume for the space, it gets kind of crowded. People, you can't even see that person back there probably behind that, that rack. Um, and then that creates an issue for staff safety. If we've got too much volume in a space and we can't move around properly, or we can't get to what we need to get to, uh, we start moving things around. You can't see somebody, someone gets ran over by a cart, it's bumped into, falls over, and now we've got you know, a claim or someone's injured that uh, you know didn't need to be if we had a, a little bit more space. So um, that's why work and process queues can be, can, can make or break a department. Uh, sight lines, so again, this all goes back to the, the staff have to interact with the equipment, but again, we want to keep the staff in the space, you know, of being productive at their workstations. So that means being on the left here, we have decontamination. You can see the processing sinks there. We can see we have those arrows drawing, and those are the sight lines from the staff at that sink workstations to the washers so that every staff has clear visibility to all of the washers. And again, on the clean side, on the right assembly side, on the right side, all of those tables, they have clear sight lines to the steam sterilizers and the washer disinfectors. So if there's a cycle that they, they need to get through um, or they're worried about, they can keep they can quickly check most modern equipment these days has large displays that you can see across the room and about what how much time is left. Um, they can do that if they sit at these workstations. And also this is so this picture is also a role model, but also a reverse role model in that my cart washers. Uh, seen on the, on the north end of the department there with the carts in front of them. Uh, no one can see them from the workstation, so they have to manually check, and the cart washers are probably going to take the, the most amount of interaction because they're constantly running, running, and running, and they have the shortest cycle. So uh, maybe a window or something like that where we can get creative with the space um, to actually add additional visibility to the front panel of the equipment, but just to give you some examples there. And again, every time they can stay at their workstations being productive, that's one less step they have to take, uh, one less chance for fatigue or, or injury. So um, that's what we're going for. Um, this is also this a little bit with, with patient safety also, I mean, controlling the spaces, um, uh, vendor sets or consigned instruments that are loaner sets. Uh, and these are sets that come in that the hospital uses that they do not own. And so sometimes they co-mingle with existing inventory. Sometimes they're you know staged or stored in the assembly area somewhere and they have the vendor representative come in and assemble the sets for them um, for the staff um, and, and re repopulate the, the instrumentation as needed or bring in new ones. And so that workflow needs to be accounted for and sometimes uh, spaces like to be more controlled and like to keep the vendors out of the department. Sometimes they let them in and they're a part of the team. And either way, I think that that workflow needs to be thought of in the design process because that's a whole room, you could possibly two rooms. In this case, you can see the top left, we have our vendor pickup where it's vendors that can pick up their stuff to leave. And at the bottom right, we have a vendor drop off where they got that instrumentation that's coming in for a case that they need to um, get into decontamination. So that where what those rooms are for is where you put them so that has a big impact on that so um it just depends and it's definitely it's sometimes an afterthought and then they have to figure it out but um you can always bring it up sooner than better uh, so the sooner you bring it up the better it'll be um detergent storage uh, uh this uh, the, increasingly they're becoming um centralized so you'll store all your detergent in one place and potentially even have another uh, department uh, like facilities come in and change out your detergent canisters for your say your washing and car washing equipment uh, that's becoming more and more popular but there are pros and cons to that uh, the, the pro is that it, you can use bigger tanks typically and then you can change them out uh, less less frequently uh, and then the staff don't have to bend over and lift up heavy jugs of, of detergent so that's saving the staff um, their backs uh, but then you know you have, might have longer runs the equipment might um, not run as efficiently. Uh, you, if you have an issue with the detergent lines, you have 100 feet or more that you have to figure out where that 
that is you could have equipment downtime more so it's it has its its pros and cons for sure but it's definitely becoming more popular and there's there's good reason for it because it is it is a big um positive for staff safety um also just mentioning in design scan stations so this is going to depend on the user's preference on you know workflow the central sterile staff want to have scan stations at every point or they want to have one scan station for an area um they need to figure that out with um the, the design team the project team but you know to make sure that we have the data lines and the power lines routed to the areas that we need them so that you can have your proper scan stations. A lot of things, you know, on wireless now, so that may be less of an issue, but still needs to be accounted for in the design space. I'm gonna take another quick poll question here. Again, you might have to scroll down to, um, to hit submit on that. Um, do you feel that your central sterile is adequately designed to maximize safety? If not, what area do you feel has the largest negative impact? So my central sterile department has an adequate design for safety, perfectly happy with it. Uh, layout and workflow could allow harm to patients or staff. That's okay. Facilities are not sufficient to secure absolute patient safety, and we do not have enough space or equipment to consistently produce acceptable outcomes. So maybe a little honesty here, let's see. Yep, a lot of 60% feel good about it. That's, that's positive to see. Um, you know, you can always make something better or improve upon something, but um, you know, it's good that a lot of, sick rate and 60% are confident in their, in their central sterile facilities. Uh, layout and workflow could allow harm to patients or staff, 20%. Now, it's important to think about that um, and even, you know, we do not have enough space or equipment to consistently produce acceptable outcomes. So between the two, that's 40% of those of you watching uh, appreciate the input. Um, but I think that speaks to maybe the opportunity um, <clears throat> that we have as, as an industry to, um, to um, increase awareness for some of these issues, increase the importance of some of these decisions that are being made um, to, to help, you know, improve that number and get it above 60%. Um, that's going to conclude the, the education portion of that. Um, just real quick, wanted to talk about just Bellamed, who are we, what are we, why are we talking about this? Uh, Bellamed, we've been sterilizing things for about 40 years now, um, gotten pretty good at it, but uh, we, we basically, we, we manufacture cart washers, ster uh, steam sterilizers, washer disinfectors um, for the central sterile department. It's all we do, it's all we focus on. We also have additional equipment like ultrasonics and processing sinks to round out the entire workflow through the space. Um, but that's that's basically what we do. But we have a, a great planning and design group that, that I run here in the U.S., uh, which delivers comprehensive project support. So every major project gets a dedicated planning and design manager. They have site analysis, equipment capacity analysis, operational cost analysis, and we'll design the workflow in Revit or AutoCAD or whatever your architects are using or your facilities are using. And then we can deliver that. And then we'll also run an industrial engineering software um, to simulate what your actual results are going to be. Uh, and then that way you can predict your, your operational performance even before you break ground or make any kind of decision. So incredibly powerful tool that we use um, for our customers and, and support our sales team. So again, my name is Steve Sutton, Director of Planning and Design Group. And I think now we're going to have to, time to take some questions. We do indeed, and there have been quite a few really great questions that have um, been entered in, so I am going to jump right in. The first question says, are you seeing more facilities build their CSSDs on the same floor as the OR? Um, no. No, I'm, I'm seeing them on uh, different floors, uh, and I'm seeing ORs span uh, multiple floors, so you'll have suites on floors three, four, five, and six, and then, you know, your CSD is on two. Um, you know, and then there's other, you know, depending on the system, they may decide to completely go, you know, they want to look at going off campus completely if they've got an older building or a lot of old equipment in, across the system. Um, but in smaller facilities where, um, you know, I would say four to six, 10 or, 10 or less ORs, you might, you would have more of an opportunity to, consolidate and have a tighter central sterile area uh, near your, your operating. But great question. Okay. Do you recommend a one way in and out way, a one way workflow for staff into and out of decontam? I've never seen that flow in the medical field. Um, 
Right. That's so you have staff come in uh, one direction and then they leave in another. Um, that's difficult to do, particularly because we're, we're fighting for space just to get a vestibule for, for staff to gown up properly. Um, uh, I've not seen it. I've seen um, um, space that's restricted from different areas. So you may have a door, but you're not allowed to enter that door. So I don't we don't typically see that, uh, at least in the U.S., um, in that space for planning, you know, um, one way workflow or one way staff entrance and exits uh, in decontamination now. Okay, this next question that came in as the pressure of decontamination should be negative. Is there a range of pressure uh, for the clean and storage areas um, that you typically look for when you're building these uh, departments? Yeah, the, the range specifically, uh, I'm not familiar with. Well, I'm not the mechanical engineer that uh, that works on the HVAC side, um, but facilities do like to see um, uh, some type of, you know, almost suction in the room. You know, they'll, they're, of course, they're monitoring them, um, but uh, I don't actually know specifically what what that range would be. But I can I can definitely look it up and, and ask facilities uh, that I work with around the country. Okay, wonderful. Uh, this one says, my hospital is planning a major renovation right now. They are concerned with maintaining service to the operating room during construction. What are my options to maintain central sterile services during the project work? Yeah, uh, yeah that's a great question. And it's one that a lot of systems uh, are battling with right now. Um, being that, you know, we want to keep the operating room functioning. Um, it's... Um, there, there's really there's four kind of main strategies that you can deploy. But one would be uh, having bring in a some sort of external uh, mobile or semi permanent structure that you could build on on your campus somewhere um, that could serve the purpose of simple sterile, like a mobile trailer or a um, or a modular building that you could that you could bring on site readily. Um, to support simple sterile services in the interim that you're down completely um, doing your renovation work. Um, the, the second option is you, you relocate your central sterile completely. If the project's big enough, um, you may need more space and you may not have it, you may be landlocked. You could relocate the entire space, either somewhere in the building um, or somewhere even um, uh, on campus, but it would be a new build. Um, so you could build new as well. Um, this may not be options for everybody, but these are, you know, overall options to consider. At least you may rule them out, but it's good to think about them um, in that way. Uh, and then you could phase it. So you could keep your services running um, while you're doing this work. Sometimes it doesn't seem possible. Um, we've done very difficult um, projects ourselves, um, and we've, with our designs to services, we help the architects figure all that out and make sure you maintain your workflow and efficacy and all that. Um, so it's definitely possible to to phase your projects um, and maintain your services while you're under construction. Okay, wonderful. Uh, this next one says, do most facilities have a separate area for gowning for decontam? Um, I would say I would say no. In my experience, I have not seen a separate area for gowning. Now they do have. I would say it's probably fifty fifty where they have a dedicated area for, for gowning. They're gonna have the PPE available, but it may just be in, in decontamination. So um, it's, a, but that doesn't help the, the staff that are have to get in there and, and start working if there's somebody already working in there. So um, I would say it's probably 50-50 in my experience. But anytime we try a new build, we, we, we do plan that in as having a vestibule or at least an alcove outside the department where they have time to sit down, put on their booties, all their, uh, the PPE that they need um, before entering space. Do you, along those lines, do you see any issues with that being a hallway, that area being a hallway where you just, you know, stick a storage cabinet, all your PPE is there before you enter the door into decontam? Right. The, that's not necessarily an issue. Um, you could do that. The, the only thing you want to be aware of is it's a corridor. You have to maintain the eight feet. If you don't have space to kind of make an alcove, now you've kind of, you don't really have anywhere to go. So you can't put a bench there or even a even a cabinet wouldn't even fit in some cases. So, um, but if you're like an in-suite hallway where you could do five feet and maybe, but you have the room, you could you could do it outside the outside the door. It's like a uh, a stopgap or an in-between where we don't have a best deal, but this is better. Um, okay. Staff going in and counting it. Great. 
This next question says, my existing department has a lot of deficiencies currently. Some you've already spoken about, <laughs> um, but I'm having trouble justifying capital for any type of project to improve this space. What can I do to justify, justify a capital improvement project for my department? What should my strategy be? Yeah, uh, that's an excellent question. The, um, the, the first thing we always have to think about is that whatever, whatever change you're going to make to your central sterile department is likely going to be an investment from a business, right? So the hospital is, you know, it's helping people, yes, we're, we're doing good things, but it's also a business at the end of the day. Um, and so we want to also, we need to relate everything that we want to do back to money, fortunately or unfortunately, however you want to look at it. Um, and uh, the way you have to frame it is that you're a key support for the operating room, which by the way, is generating likely more than 50% of the hospital's entire revenue. So you want to make sure that uh, that's running well, right? So um, you can always relate it back to um, the operating room and maintaining services and efficacy. Um, you can also, I would recommend finding some sort of champion on the leadership team um, that understands the issues that, that you have as far as um, the day-to-day -day and what you're doing and, and specifically what challenges you have. Um, you know, like things with staff safety, um, the hospital's definitely gonna want to, to, to address those uh, any way they can, and especially with patient safety. Uh, so anyone on your leadership team that you might, uh, at the executive level or even that, that would hear you out and understand what you're going through, I think it's someone you really wanna seek out. Also, uh, infection control um, has um, a, a lot of sway inside hospitals and they're trying to make things better. And so anything that you have that would relate that infection control would be concerned with uh, is, is easy for them to go and, and to, to justify. Um, the next thing you can do, if, that's, if all that's not worked or maybe it doesn't work out for you, the next thing you can do is uh, relate it back to money again. Um, how many more operating room procedures could you support if you have this, if you got this investment, right? Um, because every hospital uh, makes money on, a, on those procedures. And so they could easily equate that back to uh, an operational increase in their in their margins, right? In their in their revenue, so uh, that that is going to have a direct positive impact on the business, and so you know that that's a, that's an easier sell as a as a business decision. So you always try to want to reframe it like that. Um, it's a challenge um, because a lot, a lot of hospitals see the central sterile area as a cost center or just a we need to have it, but you know we really want to invest in the operating rooms because that's making the money. But that's you really have to reframe reframe the argument. Okay, but, yeah, wonderful. So, one more question for you: What are the considerations when the planner wants to move sterile processing's existing equipment into a newly built sterile processing department instead of purchasing new? Yeah, that is an excellent question. Um, uh, it's that's very challenging. First of all, uh, it depends on where you're moving it to. If it's across the hall, it's more doable. You will likely have to do it in phases because, um, or you might have to spend more money to uh, pay somebody to do it faster. Uh, moving washer disinfectors, uh, that's easier, uh, I would say. Um, uh, the cycles are shorter when you have to revalidate and things like that when you hook up to equipment. Um, if you do it over, say, a weekend, where they take you down on Friday afternoon and then they move everything over, um, washers are easier to do. You could probably do maybe two, maybe three on a small small department over a weekend um, comfortably. Um, but then steam sterilizers, cycles are longer. They're going to need to revalidate those um, uh, typically. And so even if they run, have to run three validation cycles, that's going to be, you know, three hours, and that's per machine. And then you've got to move them in set level. Um, that can be very challenging to do. So sometimes you may want to get a time estimate from, um, a third party or whoever's doing the work, whatever manufacturer is moving this equipment prior to, you know, agreeing to that because they're going to have to set the schedule. And you may have to do it in phases, unfortunately. Um, car washers, uh, typically those are assembled on site and um, and uh, some manufacturers won't even relocate those because they never go back together the same way. And it just wouldn't be a, wouldn't be good for anybody. So, um that would be that would be very hard to do over a weekend, and you would definitely need to be down. Or if you did relocate a car washer, it would definitely be a week or two. Okay, wonderful. I believe that is all the questions that came through. Uh, Stephen, thank you for your presentation. Um, yeah.
I am so excited that we rounded out the day explaining how to design a workflow and layout that minimizes staff strain and fatigue while promoting quality and productivity. It's all related to patient safety, and we're excited that you are part of this Beyond Clean Safety Burst conference. If we have any additional questions for Steve that we didn't get to or that you think of in the coming weeks or days, feel free to reach out to him. His contact information is in the speaker bio form uh, on the right-hand side of your page. A special thank you to Sertal International for making today's event possible as our sponsor. Uh, as we close, we'd like to recognize all of the professionals who contribute to safer processing of surgical instruments across the globe every single day. For all of you who chose to spend the day educating yourself, we'd like to thank you for your dedication to professional development, best practice, and safety. At the session's close, you will be directed to the Beyond Clean virtual conference page where you can access your CE certificate. There's a little button on the page next to these conference session graphics that's titled CE certificate. Click on that, take the brief survey and your downloadable certificate will pop up for you. Stay safe out there, Sterile Processing. Thank you for joining us for the first ever conference dedicated to your safety. We're glad you're here and we encourage you to, as always, keep fighting dirty. Everyone have a great rest of the weekend. We'll talk to you soon.